In the Second World War, a chaplain was ready to preach to a regiment of soldiers who were haggard and weary, just come back from the front lines. As they drew up in the field under the open sky, which was their church for that day, it began to rain miserably on these weary men. They were exhausted, and they didn't feel like listening to a sermon. The chaplain pondered and prayed and then stepped forward to preach. He said, my text is, what think ye of Christ? And then he said, and here's my sermon. What think ye of Christ? You are dismissed. Straight to the point, the most important question, what do you think of Jesus? Today, our program is entitled, Jesus Mediator of the New Covenant. Welcome to Scripture Pursuit. I'm Glenn Russell, your host. We're so glad that you've joined us for our Bible discussion today as we pursue a little bit more about the book of Hebrews. And now let's welcome our guest, a frequent contributor, pastor and friend, Pastor Skip McCarty. Welcome, Skip. We're glad to have you with us. How awesome to be here. And thank you for inviting me to participate with the New Covenant. I know this is a particular interest uh, to you. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your background in studying about the covenants. This has been a lifetime study, hasn't it? Well, since the year 2000, it has. Um, and that's when I started studying in earnest and then had a book published in 2007 by the encouragement of a number of others. And, and uh, I've continued to study since then. And that book title, Skip, is? In Granite or Ingrained. Very clever title there, in granite, in stone, or ingrained into our hearts and minds. Exactly. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Skip McCarty, for joining us. We want to remind our listeners or viewers, you can always go to scripturepursuit.wordpress.com, or you can search for Scripture Pursuit on YouTube and find it there. But before we go any further, we really need God to open our hearts and minds to his word. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that as we pause for a few moments in the busyness and the activities of life. And we open your word. We need you to open our hearts and lead us Mm. into a deeper understanding of who you are. Because you've said, if you're lifted up, if if we know you, then we will love you and we'll be drawn to you. So teach us more of who you are, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, we're in the book of Hebrews. And uh, Hebrews is explaining to us a little bit about who Jesus is, and he's better than everything else. Amen. And uh, where would you want us to start as we talk about Jesus, uh, the mediator of the new covenant? Well, let's start with the new covenant. All right. There's a lot of confusion on what the new covenant is. Mm. I I have books on the the, uh, covenants that talk about the new covenant. And don't even mention what it is. Don't even try to define it. Mm. I have one book on the on the covenants that uh, spends two chapters defining the new covenant, and they don't even mention the two mm. places where God has defined the new covenant. One in the Old Testament in Jeremiah, one in the New Testament in Hebrews. And uh, so I like to focus directly on God's definition of the new covenant. Okay, maybe I could read. Uh, perhaps you're pointing us towards Hebrews chapter eight. Yes. uh, Let's read uh, a little bit there. I'd like to read starting even actually back in verse 7 and down through verse 12, if that would be all right, so we can get a context. Okay. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 and following. For if that first covenant had been faultless, that no place, then no place would have been sought for a second, because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregard them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. What a beautiful passage. Hebrews chapter 8. 
Amen. There's some promises there, Pastor Skip. What would you want us to know about these promises? Well, these promises, four of them here, um, they encompass the entire gospel, and they are the new covenant. And when anyone asks about the new covenant, they should start right here. Hmm. Hebrews uh, 8, 8 to 10, where God defines it. And uh, he's just quoting from Jeremiah chapter 31, where it was prophesied. Uh, this, the new covenant was prophesied. And uh, um, Glenn, the, the new covenant has a history to it. It doesn't just show up bang cold, because even when Jeremiah prophesied it, people recognized it. It had been the, the history of the covenants is that as it began in Gen Genesis 3.15, when Adam and Eve sinned, God showed up immediately and gave them a promise. He was going to crush the head of that serpent, ultimately, through a seed that Eve would eventually bear her de through her descendants. And the, what, then he would put enmity between them and, the, and that serpent. And, and uh, then uh, there was a covenant with Noah that God would never destroy the earth again with a another flood. There was a covenant with Abraham where God said through your seed abraham mm. um the messiah essentially is going to come and you're going to inherit the promised land that i'm offering you and abraham understood that also as heaven itself and and then this covenant was sinai but what he was doing uh glenn is that he was rolling out these the the more and more information about the plan of salvation and every time there was a new covenant as as uh, for instance when abraham uh, was given a covenant. It grandfathered in the promises, the gospel promises of the previous covenants. And then the covenant with Israel at Sinai grandfathered in the promises that were given to Abraham. And so, um, and, and over that time, God was rolling out these promises. And so mm -hmm. by the time Jeremiah prophesies about the new covenant, they knew those promises, God had given it to them already. And, and uh, so that's kind of the history of it. But then when you look at the promises themselves, I'll put my law in your heart and write them on your, or in your mind and write them on your heart. Hmm. I mean, God is just, he's saying, you know, I'm going to line, realign your character to be like mine. And then I want to be your God and, and you're going to be my people. I make that promise to you if you just, just trust me. And, uh, um, and then he promises that the day is going to come, no matter how discouraging, how, how things get in the world, how, how life can go crazy all around us, the day is going to come when everyone's going to be worshiping the Lord. We're not going to have to be gospelizing uh, after that, evangelizing. But until then, that's our job, and both in the Old Testament and the New. And this and is not to say that everybody will be saved, but there will come a no. time when all the saved will know and the others have rejected it. Yes. But it is, it is to yes. say that, you know, when you say new, it almost would give the impression that there's a failure in the old one. But the failure is not on God's part. It's human right. failure. And so God says, let me try again. Let me try again. It's the same thing that I'm wanting. I'm wanting an internalized faith. I want a relationship with you. That's why he says here right. to be merciful to them. Uh, their unlo uh, unrighteous deeds and lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, that, that was the, it was a promise of forgiveness. Um, and the newer translations say uh, um, forgiveness there. Mm -hmm. Um, quoting, quoting from Jeremiah, the Hebrew in Jeremiah, um, that God's promising to forgive their sins. And that first showed up in the Sinai covenant, first time it spoke of forgiveness. And now he's just reaffirming it here in the new covenant. And th these are the promises. This is the new covenant. It's what it is. It's beautiful. It's, in com it's, it's comprehensive. Now, where does Jesus fit in this? Because we're, we get the idea of a new covenant now, which is a special relationship of love and commitment and faithfulness from God to us, and then our response to him. Uh, how does this fit in with Jesus? Well, that's what makes a new covenant new. It's not new promises. The promises have been given already um, previously. But it's what, what makes the new covenant new is Jesus, in fact. Mm -hmm. He shows up, and, um, and no one had lived out fully the, the, uh, the law being written in their hearts. The law was written in the hearts of many in, in the Old Testament area, era, but they, had, they were all so faulty. They, they were imperfect. Jesus came and perfectly 
The law was written in his heart and he lived it perfectly, totally. Um, before Jesus came, they had animal sacrifices that were looking forward to the Messiah coming and offering his life as a sacrifice for them. Jesus was that sacrifice. He was that covenant. Isaiah speaks of him as the covenant. God was giving uh, Jesus, uh, his, his servant, his Messiah as, as a covenant to the people. And so the new covenant really is about Jesus. And the key passage here, Glenn, is in verse 22. Okay, if let's you, go if, back to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. It's yes. just talked about Jesus as being a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then it says, Hebrews 7, 22, by so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. That word surety, new translations use the word guarantor. Mm -hmm. My wife used to be in the mortgage industry. That's what, that was what, what her career was before she retired. And they have, um, if someone couldn't, didn't have quite enough money to buy a home uh, or to make payments on it or whatever, they were just a little short or a lot short sometimes, um, they could get a co-signer, a relative or someone who had good credit, who would, who would sign. In other words, and then if they defaulted on their debt, hmm. the bank or mortgage company knew that they could go to the co-signer and the co-signer would pay the debt. Well, that's the way God set up his covenant, that if humanity failed, Adam failed to live perfectly, he could have given his descendants um, all the, 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 no, none of the suffering. Um, but when he failed, Jesus showed up immediately and said, the seed's gonna come who will crush the head of the serpent. In other words, I'll be the co-signer. He went through a ceremony with Abraham that uh, um, I won't describe the ceremony right now, uh, but, but in which he said, again, I will be the co-signer on your debt and on the debt of your descendants. When Jesus came, that word surety is, we can think that it's the word co-signing, the guarantor. So Jesus came and the debt that humanity um, needed to, to uh, pay in order to regain the eternal inheritance God prepared for them, um, that none of us could have, none of us could pay was, was uh, paid by Jesus Christ. He gave his life. He, first of all, he lived a perfect life. Mm -hmm. So he could give us a perfect life because mm. he, he's in heaven right now representing us. So God can look at us as though we hadn't sinned. If we put our faith in him and, 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 and uh, seek to follow him, ask him to write his law in our hearts. And then he, he died the sacrificial death, the second death the Bible talks about um, that, that paid our, the debt for our sins. So he's given us everything that's what makes the new covenant new. That's what leads us to worship and leads us to obedience, doesn't it? Because what gratitude that everything we need is provided. He is example. Amen. An example, know who to follow, or how to follow, what it can be, what it should be. But more than that, he's also the sacrifice, as you've said. And what, a, what an amazing thing that he takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. Amen. He died the second death so that we don't have to. Um, just everything we need is found in Jesus. And, and that is why the writer of Hebrews here seems to be kind of warning folks, look, don't slip away. There's nothing that's better than Jesus. Don't, don't get passive. Don't become uh, lukewarm in your allegiance, in your devotion, because you know, it's almost, uh, Pastor Skip, as if it's someone's telling a, a young husband, don't stop loving your bride because you're not going to find anyone better. She's the one for you. And, and Jesus is, is all that we need. And so how tragic if we fall away. Amen. Exactly right. Yep, because there can be a lot of, a lot of doubts that come along the way when life seems to be you're trying to do the best you can and life seems to be upended just in a, in a single phone call sometimes um in a single incident and you just want it just shatters everything about your life and uh you and you've just taken so much in life for granted and even god for granted in a sense and uh and so it can have that effect of just shaking our faith yeah you're right absolutely and, and he's saying hold on hold on these promises are absolutely secure 
Jesus is in heaven, representing you in heaven right now. As, and uh, his perfection is yours. He applies it to you. And his death is, is, has, taken, has wiped out your sins. So, so just hold on. I have a friend of mine who's a financial planner, and he often will say, well, take it to the bank. You can count it. Take it to the bank, you know. And uh, when he kind of gave his heart to Christ, he was like, well, take it to the cross. He says, that's your bank. That's, that's the thing you can count on. Your surety. What a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful thing. Now, we've kind of assumed something that probably we should go back and ask ourselves if you think it's the right time, but what's the difference between new covenant and old? We don't want to get too far before we explore that because um, it needs to probably be spelled out a little bit for us. Mm -hmm. Well, we've kind of been talking about that in a way because the difference is Jesus came. Jesus mm -hmm. came in the middle. It's the same promises. The promises are not different, but no one had fulfilled them. And Jesus came, and when he came, that made everything new. You know, Glenn, some of us can think back to when I actually grew up in the church, but I had a time, too, when I had a conversion. I can look at the actual time, <laughs> the day that I had, a, I had a conversion, and I knew that this now was mine. <laughs> this this uh, faith I'd grown up with, um, uh, and Jesus himself was was mine. And... and uh, it, my life was, uh, there were a number of events that led up to that, but my life was this, if, if someone had taken, um, drawn my blood the, the day after my conversion and the day before, they would see no difference, I don't think, in any of my blood markers. Hmm. But I was a different person. Life, I mean, I just, I, I, I saw a tree even, and that tree was shouting to me, God is love. And the grass was saying to me, God is love. It's just amazing. Life was different. And that's the way it was when Jesus came. When he came, life changed. It was changed. The promises were the same, the, but, but the fact that, and when he came, he fulfilled them. And then he gave them, gave them to us. Um, you know, there's something about the, um, as the new covenant grandfathered in the promises that, that were given previously and grandfathering all the gospel elements that had been revealed through the, through the centuries and the millennium, the millenniums. Um, at the same time, it retroactively applied to everybody who had come before. Mm -hmm. So Jesus' death didn't wait until he died before people could be forgiven. Throughout the Old Testament, God's telling the people their sins are forgiven. When they repent, their sins are forgiven. And Psalm, Psalm 103, that's the theology of the, of, the, uh, of the Sinai covenant, starts right out, right out by saying, he forgives all your sins. And then down just a few lines, it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, he didn't wait until he died for that. So even though, even though it was new, it was absolutely new, it was different because Jesus now had ratified, ratified the covenant that would that would apply all the benefits throughout history to people. Okay, so <clears throat> let's let's uh, take a scenario here. If someone in what we might call Old Testament times came to the sanctuary bringing a lamb, that lamb, what did the blood of that lamb do? Did it have some some power in itself? Uh, how could a person do bring a sacrifice and have it be meaningful as opposed to other times when the prophet said, you know, I don't want to hear your sacrifices. I don't want your, because it's vain, it's useless. So what made the difference? Well, um, David said in his great Psalm of confession and repentance in Psalm 51, he said, you know, it's not sacrifices you want. It's, hmm. It's a changed heart. It's a cleansed heart, and and uh, so the sacrifices were pointing forward to what would provide forgiveness for us. Hmm. That there would be an innocent victim because the sacrifice had to be a perfect animal, yeah. no blemish, whatever, showing that whoever would offer that sacrifice when the Messiah came, the Messiah would be sacrificed. That that uh, he would be unblemished. He would be spotless, without sin, and. <clears throat> And so it had 
had that uh, um, that uh, um, uh, it, it, it changed, God is still working on the heart, still bringing conversion and repentance and, and applying forgiveness for what was going to happen in the future was applied retroactively. Um, so as they and, look forward to the cross, we look back to the cross, but it still is centered in, in what Jesus would do. Absolutely. Yep. And that's one of the big differences then um, between the old covenant and new covenant is that is, is the whole sacrificial system was, was uh, um, uh, no longer continued after Jesus died for us. It wasn't necessary anymore. Pastor Skip, our time is moving quickly here. We have about five more minutes. Hey, Hebrews mm -hmm. 7 through 10 is this long passage that kind of explores covenants, and it's a very rich um, uh, description mm -hmm. of the covenants. What, what else would you want to uh, have us look from there? And then I think you have something especially you want to wrap us up with. Yes. The, uh, yeah. Well, Hebrews 11, the very next chapter, it's very instructive that, that just after he gives this long discourse, longest in the Bible, on the covenants, then is Hebrews 11. Because Hebrews 11 is a list of, of the people in the Old Testament, just a representative list mm. of many in the Old Testament, from people who were, had, had really rough lives, you'd think no hope for them, all the way to, to uh, um, Enoch and, and uh, uh, Abel and so forth, all these, Abraham. Um, and it's say what it's saying is in essence, it says they're all right, made righteous by faith, by their faith. And in essence, it's saying that, uh, um, that they were, they were, they were receiving the benefits of mm -hmm. what Jesus would do for them prior to his actual act of doing it. They were, they were new covenant people, if you please, living in the old covenant era, in the, in the old Testament era. That's something that many Christians don't perceive, especially if we just say, well, the Old Covenant is the Old Testament, New Covenant is New Testament. That's not the correct definition. Correct. That's true. Yep. New covenant, the New Covenant is not just for the New Covenant. The mm -hmm. New Covenant is when Jesus ratified everything. All right. By his blood. Yep. yep. So they, these believers hundreds of years, thousands of years before, are experiencing what you and I can experience. Amen. Yep. All right. Um, Hebrews chapter 9, you have a reference there, Hebrews 9, 15. And yes. let me just read that verse if I could. Um, that, shows the re that shows the retroactive uh, uh, benefit that people received, even in the Old Testament times, from Jesus' death. All right, Hebrews 9, 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the in eternal inheritance. So he, as it says here, he's the one who redeems the transgressions under the first covenant. That's exactly right. Amazing. Yep, yep, yep. Jesus does it all, beginning to end. Amazingly powerful. Goes back Amen. in time, goes universally through all people everywhere. Universal and timeless in its effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, as we kind of move towards summing up uh, the new covenant, what would you want us to keep in mind? What are the benefits? What difference does it make? I'm going to read you just a short passage here from a little book called Steps to Christ. This really tells the whole story. This is the new covenant, okay. in essence. The condition of eternal life is just now what it has always been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents, perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness. That sounds a little discouraging. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness to the whole universe would be imperiled. The way would be open for sin with all of its train of woe and misery to be immortalized. It was possible for Adam before the fall to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law. But he failed to do this. And because of his sin, our natures are fallen. We cannot make ourselves righteous. Since we're sinful and unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. That's our great dilemma. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. There's the new covenant. 
He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. And now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake, you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character and you're accepted before God as if you had never sinned. And more than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You're to maintain this connection with Christ by, by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to live and do according to his good pleasure. Then with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit, do the same good works, works of righteousness and obedience. So we have nothing in ourselves of which to boast. We got no ground for self-exaltation. Our only hope, ground of hope, is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, given to us, and in that wrought by his spirit working in and through us. That's the whole story right there, Glenn. Powerful promises. Last Amen. sentence or two, Pastor Skip, your last sentence or two, what do you want us to hold on to? I want to hold on to God would do anything for you. He has, he will, he will continue. If you come to him and keep coming to him, you're as safe as though you're in the kingdom of God. Oh, that's beautiful. Reason for worship, reason for rejoicing. Thank you so Amen. much to our guest, Pastor Skip McCarty. We're certainly finding that there's much in God's word. I would encourage you to go back, spend some time in the book of Hebrews, especially chapter 7 through 10, and study more about this covenant. And again, if you want to refer to that quotation, it's from Steps to Christ, pages 62 and 63. Uh, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful quotation there. And now we invite you to join us again next time. But until then, today and every day, let's continue to pursue the God of the scriptures. Amen.